All right, I guess it's time. So my name's Richard Campbell. Uh, that's my Twitter handle or my X handle or the social media formerly known as Twitter handle, easy way to reach me. This uh, particular talk derives from another talk I've been giving uh, since 2019 when folks were asking, like, what do you think is going to happen in the next decade for software? I make all these podcasts about software development, so I get to talk to a lot of experts about the various you know, things that are being developed and how things are progressing and what we should be looking forward to. And so it's, it makes it easier for me to do some speculation looking forward. And when I wrote the first version in 2019, I was thinking, hey, we've got a new decade coming. This is going to be cool. Let's talk, let's talk about what software development is going to be like in the 2020s. Not thinking by February of 2020, we were going to be thinking very differently all of a sudden. And so one of the segments I put, put in the next decade talk was this mention of the pandemic. Initially, when I did the version in 2020, I said, look, we're in a pandemic. We're trying to figure out what that's going to be like. But you can expect it's going to have some impact on how uh, companies spend money. You know, we're going to spend a lot of money managing this problem uh, between developing medicines, treating people that are ill, and that's going to have a ripple through our whole economy. And I sort of said kind of casually in all of that, you know, as a developer, we usually don't worry a lot about that sort of thing, but it may come back to haunt us. So be more aware. Uh, and then by 21, it became more obvious that was a problem. And in 22, it became really, really obvious it was a problem. And so I ended up taking just that comment, that little segment in the portion of the next decade talk and making it into its own talk, which is this one. Uh, because for the most part, I think tech, technology people, software people did just fine in the pandemic. We were working for a home before it was cool, right? And our friend Satya said that in a period of about two months, March, April, May, we moved more workloads in the cloud in those couple of months than they moved the previous two years. Sending everybody to work from home made us find ways to solve problems. And so while it's not a big deal that we work from home, I do think it's going to be an interesting piece of history of watching the rest of our companies sort of deal with the Zoom call effect. Like, I almost think there could be a visual history of Zoom because you have that, you remember that first phase where everybody just had a bad camera or no camera and we were all muted? I mean, now just only one of us is muted, but I mean, what's for, and then there was that next phase when the snap cam came out and everybody had a stupid hat on or an animation running around in the frame. Then there was the pet phase when everybody had to show their pet or their baby on. And now I, I think we've evolved an etiquette for video uh, for companies now where you see most people come on initially to say hi and then a lot of people shut the camera off right away because we're a distraction or more importantly, we don't want to pay attention anymore. So, I mean, it literally, we've had a crazy few years of these changes. But getting back to the more significant parts from, uh, you know, is not the pandemics really end, they just sort of wind down. You know, this was true in 1918. You know, that flu just kept coming back. In fact, it does today. It's H1N1. It's just that 100 years on, it's not as lethal. Uh, and we make vaccines for it every year. And this appears to be what's happening with COVID-19 as well. And likely we're going to continue to make vaccines for it also. But those three years did have a lot of impact on infrastructure. We run, we live in a largely globalized world that the interruptions that happened in different parts of the world had ripple effects everywhere. China's shutdown problems affected an awful lot of shipping. The rush to move PPE to the West resulted in huge numbers of empty containers being left behind that have only just now started to clear up. The impact on global supply chain has just taken a long time. We found out that an awful lot of companies that were working just in time didn't cope with uh, interruptions in supply and so partially finished products everywhere. Uh, that then got damaged or were no longer suitable to be finished. So 
it's a really a, comp a complex set of moving pieces that's gotten to this point where the supply and interruption meant that people who had demand for key products were willing to pay for more for them, and suddenly we had inflationary effects. Now, there's inflation caused by monetary policy, but there's also inflation caused by demand and behavior, and the two kind of ripple against each other. And so when you look at the consequences of the pandemic, we did have an inflationary period that caught a lot of governments by surprise. We also had some cultural changes. Folks being kept at home for a few years started reevaluating the way they wanted to work and what they wanted to do. And at one point in 2022, we were talking about that great resignation that everybody sort of shuffled their jobs around. Part of that, I feel like, was just pent-up demand. While we were in this crisis, nobody was willing to quit. And so you suddenly had two or three years of delay career changing all catch up at once. And that had an interesting knock-on effect to that crazy supply chain problem because suddenly you had a lot of new people in jobs, especially jobs that had been shut down for a while because they didn't make sense during the pandemic. You know, most systems are, can tolerate about a 5% inefficiency. One in 20 employees are new. But what happens when one in two employees are new? This whole systems run less efficiently and things take longer and that cascades onto other problems. And so we were threatened with this pandemic economic collapse. Now, did it happen? That's a great question. I mean, it's October of 23, and some of the numbers are, are good and some of the numbers are bad. Lots of things are weird. Certainly earlier this year, the tech giants decided that the situation later in the year was going to be serious. Although one would argue there's other forces acting on that. For example, Microsoft. Uh, latest reported quarter, this is the second largest company in the world by capitalization. It's a $2 trillion capitalized company, uh, which is an unbelievably huge number to conceive of for 220,000 employees. And in their last quarter, their gross revenues were $56 billion, and they netted $24 billion on that, which is an unbelievably good ratio. Now, I work pretty closely to micro, with Microsoft, so I was abundantly aware that in 21, they hired almost 40,000 employees in a year, which is an insane number. But there was this concern with the pandemic continuing that if they didn't grab up po folks with some skills, they were going to be harder and harder to get by. And one would argue that they overhired. But the consequence was that early this year, they laid off 10,000 plus employees. And that put a scare into a lot of folks. You know, Microsoft rarely lays people off, especially numbers as large as that, although I would argue in a 200,000 person company, when you're laying off 10,000 people, like it's barely 5%. Normal corporate turnover is like two and a half to three. So while it sounds like a big number on paper, it's not actually that large a number, but it had a sort of shock effect on the workers inside of Microsoft and elsewhere in the tech industry. And this ripped across all of the tech giants. So Google, who also had an unbelievable quarter, like the, this past quarter was $74 billion, they made about $18 billion. And they really made it off of exactly one product, which is ad revenue. That's what, they, that's what Google does. They keep trying to make other things, but nothing seems to make quite as much money as, sell, as showing you stuff you don't want to buy on every website you can go to. Uh, but they also laid off 12,000 employees this past year. And for the most part, have continued hiring at the same time. And then Amazon is the monster. Again, same quarter, $134 billion. But their net was 7.7 .7 on that. Because my Amazon really isn't actually a tech company. They're a warehousing company. They stock unbelievable arrays of products all over the world and deliver them to, to you within a day or two, as long as you pay them $100 plus a year for Prime. And uh, they, a lot of those workers, and they've got a lot of them, 1.9 million employees, they laid off something like 30,000 this year, mostly in the warehousing space. Although they did take big chunks out of the tech community as well. 
And I would throw in meta here, much smaller fish in this pool, especially at the beginning of this year when the change to meta and the idea that we're all going to wear virtual glasses all the time for social media seemed like a good idea. I mean, only to one guy, but he had a lot of money and power, so he tried to make it come true. But uh, they've got a little hipper now with threads and some of the new things they're doing. But still, this past quarter, 30, 32 billion in revenue, netting 7.8. Like we keep thinking that Facebook is doomed until you look at the numbers and you're like, this company still makes a giant pile of money and they don't have that many employees. It's only about uh, 80,000 employees at Meta and they laid off about 15,000 over the course of this past year. And I throw all those numbers at you just to say the anxiety we've, that a lot of tech folks have been feeling this year has been that these tech giants have done these layoffs and that shocked a lot of the employees and made them hunker down. I think they, they, this is almost a lash back against the great resignation and the sense that people want more from their work. And at the same time, at least in the United States, unemployment is incredibly low. That most people who want a job have a job. There's an argument that in Western economies, you need about a 5% unemployment label layer just to have enough mobility for people to move around and work. So anytime you see the number below that, it's actually kind of problematic. Now, there are higher unemployment rates in other countries, and certainly Portugal struggles with that. Uh, they, it's a different economy here, and they have their own set of issues, and across Europe in general, there are other issues going on here. So I don't just want to lean on pure U.S. numbers here that there are other uh, employment factors that go into it. But I do press the point that we're in an industry that consistently hasn't been able to fill 20% of its jobs. The growth of the workspace is faster than we can train, and that has literally been true for decades. But there was a sense at the beginning of this year with this wave of layoffs and concern that maybe that was over that there's a pushback to that, well, maybe we have enough. And none of the real numbers make this true, that actually there's still too much work. And while companies are hesitating to hire, it's mostly out of fear, not financial desperation. Because fear's enough. If you're a business owner and you're trying to decide whether you're gonna hire a few more people to move a little faster, but you're seeing the tech giants lay off and you're seeing threats of recession and economic impact from the pandemic, maybe you hold a little money back, you have a little more concerned. And so there was a sense of sort of pushing back. Now, when I was doing this talk six months ago, there was a lot more weight on the idea that by the end of this year, there's gonna be a recession, things are gonna be harder, but we're kinda of here now and there's still no sign of it. And I'm a pretty optimistic guy, but I haven't been laid off, so it's pretty easy to be optimistic when you still you know, have your income in play. Talk to someone who has been and is struggling to find the equivalent job they have, it's a bit tougher for them. So I wanna be empathetic, but at the same time, like the numbers aren't there. That being said, as an old developer, as someone who's literally written code for 40 years. I have gone through significant economic hardship when I was a software developer. And it occurred to me in all of the work that I do telling stories that it's been more than 20 years since there's really been a downturn that impacted software developers. You know, we had a bit of an economic crisis in 2008 and 2009. But for the most part, the development industry was unaffected. It was a housing crisis caused primarily in the US that rippled across the banking sector. So there were layoffs in the housing industry, there were layoffs in the banking industry, but most developers just kept working. So I'm gonna let that one go. I kind of got to back up all the way to the end of the dot-com boom to like 2001. And at that time, we were training developers as fast as we could because we needed to make more pets.com websites. Like, you couldn't make websites fast enough. And there were like 16-week boot camps, and now you're a web developer. And when that madness finally ended, 
Yeah, a lot of those folks had a tough time finding a job. And it scared people off of development for a while. And, you know, I've seen this gap where folks that were making career decisions in the 2001, 2002 timeframe said, whatever you do, don't go into software development. People lose their jobs there. But if you did go into software development at that time, you've had about a 20-year run of pretty much there's more work than you could possibly do. What do you want to work on? Like, keep on going. And the possibility that that might bobble for a moment, it's a pretty good one. And there's things we can do. So for someone like me, who jumped into software development in the 80s when we had a widespread economic recession, we thought about software a lot more differently. We were way more concerned with the return on investment for software. So what am I really talking about? Well, in the end, we write code for money because our companies can take that code and make more money with it. In theory, anyway. You know. The real question is, how connected are you to all of that? It really come, when we talk about return investment, we take about how much does it cost for us to create this software and how much return does it have? How long does it take and how much does it cost and when will we make that back in the benefits of that software? So it's a money question, and there's a bunch of ways to look at the money around it. It's like, do you know how your company makes money? Because rarely for us as developers are we directly attached to the revenue stream of the company. We're indirectly attached. We tend to be staff opposed to line. We make tools to allow the folks that make the money for the company to be more effective, which is highly leverageable. Like When you do that well, you can substantially expand the ability of an individual to bring in uh, revenue for the company. So I'm not saying it's a waste of time. Like That's good stuff. There's a reason we're digitizing the economy and doing all of these things. The question is, are we properly connected to it? Do you know how your company makes money? Does what you're doing inside the company save money? Does it cost money? Does it make money? And often we're disconnected from that. We just don't need to worry about those pieces at all. So I want to talk about some activities we can do as developers with an eye to ROI. So just that mindset of what's the value prop around it. Because without a doubt, there's work you can do inside of an organization that makes you look very busy. It might even be work you're being asked to do, but is it actually providing value? Because should there be an economic concern, or should the company just be uncertain enough that they're like, maybe we should reduce the workforce for a bit, they are going to pick the folks that provide the least return. And more importantly, they won't be picking the folks where they can clearly see they can provide a substantial value to the organization. So. Not one way to solve this problem, and, no, and there are many things you can do. So let's run through a few of them and just consider some possibilities. The first is, are you as productive a developer as you could be? How well do you use your tools? You know, the, the hot new tool on the block is Copilot. And if you haven't spent some time with it, maybe you should. Because most developers who get engaged with this tool in whatever platform you're working on, whatever language you like working in, I'm not going to need to shill for Microsoft on this. As much as Microsoft has GitHub as a wholly owned subsidiary, GitHub Copilot works on lots of different platforms, but it is a super stack overflow. Or at least it's a mechanism for helping to produce code quickly to get you over that blank screen syndrome, to help you with language examples if you're not super strong in a language. So there's a lot of ways you can use GitHub Copilot, and it's well worth spending a little time on that. It's, I think the name's phenomenal. The great thing about calling it Copilot is you're the pilot, which means it's all your fault. Now, the... As much as I have deep concerns about chat, GPT, and large language models in general, and if you've been listening to some of the stuff I've made, I've been a, somewhat of a vocal critic. A, I don't like hype. Uh, I think hype makes people do stupid things. And B, no tool is perfect. And if you think your tool is perfect, you're on a path to failure. And so my push was always, 
Let's understand what this tool is good at and what it's bad at. That being said, this particular tool has two things going for it. The first is you. You write code and you read code and the code it spits out sometime is crap. But sometimes it's pretty good ideas. At least it's a, it's a creative stimulus. The software is not creative. You're creative. But sometimes the software can provide you ingredients to help stimulate your creativity. So it might spit out a version of a particular algorithm you haven't seen before, sparks your ideas on how to write a better one. And if you get good with this tool, this is a productivity booster. And in an environment where we're concerned about providing value to our organization, tools that can improve our productivity are good tools. So it's not the only tool in the box. You've got to figure out how you like to develop software. But often we're too busy doing the work to worry about the tool. Uh, Stephen Covey is an old school productivity guy. He has this book called The Seven Habits. Three of them were about managing your life better. Three of them were about help, were interacting with others. And the last one, the number seven, was called Sharpening the Saw. And it was the idea that once in a while, you got to stop doing work and improve your tools. And the line was always, guy working hard, cutting down a big tree with one of those big old saws back and forth. Somebody asked him, well, how long have you been doing that? He's like, oh, two hours. It's like, wow, you're barely halfway through. Have you thought about, you know, sharpening the saw? And he goes, I got no time for that. I got to cut this tree down. Often we're so busy building software, we don't think about if we're actually building it the best way we could be building it. That maybe a day of looking through our suite of tools and the way we're making things could find some optimization that would make every other day better. So I'm using Copilot as the exemplar here just because it's new and it does provide some distinct benefits, but everything you work in right now, it's worth scrutiny. Just a little time, maybe find some rewards and be the more productive version of yourself. Uh, jump into another stack. I have paid close attention, as someone who works in software all the time, on these low-code, no-code solutions. Uh, I pick on Power Platform just because I often live in Microsoft land, and a lot of customers have M365 already, and they may or may not be using this. Now, if you're a, a, a developer, and it's dangerous to say professional developer, because what does that make the Power Platform person? These are productivity tools that build heterogeneous clients quickly. They are a limited set of functionality compared to the tools that we have. They're good at forms over data problems, but they spit out phone, tablet, and PC clients quickly. They need back-end services in the cloud to work. They're really only for eternal apps by the way that they're licensed. But if you can get people to start building those clients for you, especially people that know the domain well, so they're going to build the client they would use, it's not like you were getting to the bottom of your to-do list anyway. Like anything that can speed that process up is useful. Microsoft for a while was talking about this technology from the perspective of what they called fusion development, that there was a role for the developers using the traditional Visual Studio type tools to build components to work with Power Platform tools. Uh, we are seeing this, these products emerge, and I know this is an active area because there's about 20 products in this place. Power Platform is one of them, it's the Microsoft one. You know, Amazon has Honeycode, Oracle has Appian, but the fact that there's adversity to them just sort of speaks to the fact that we're at an inflection point in forms over data development in the cloud. And when you're measuring yourself on your ability to deliver features, the idea that you could have a tool that would speed up that, at least that client side for you, it's interesting. If not necessarily for you to use, to collaborate with others that are using it, because the combination of your skills on the back end and their skills on the front end deliver more value in less time. We'll never be done with the cloud conversation. The cloud transformation continues to go on. I'm kind of liking where we are at the moment. We've gotten over the panic of the, uh, of the pandemic where we moved workloads quickly. I see a little more right-sizing going on these days where folks are figuring out, hey, 
that thing doesn't run that well in the cloud, or it does run in the cloud, but it's really expensive. Like, does that make sense? And some workloads are going back on-prem. On the providers now, and Microsoft being among them, are getting better at talking about hybrid is the normal, that a certain amount of infrastructure stays on-premises, a certain amount of workloads make sense in the cloud, especially when you're dealing with folks that aren't in the office. You know, the ability to proxy from a mul to multiple locations is hard. And so cloud services help with an awful lot of that. Now, there are folks who are not big fans of the cloud, but those are mostly folks that are looking at workloads from how they were running on-prem and just shifting them directly to cloud, which arguably is the worst way to do it. It's fast, doesn't require as many changes, but you are thinking infrastructure. I'm using someone else's computer that I can pay for by the minute. Now, typically, when I built out systems for my companies uh, myself, I provisioned for peak. You figure out what's the maximum load for a given application that's going to run on a set of infrastructure, and you buy to that, because that's all the infrastructure you have. And you'll deal with the fact that half the time it's not being used, and once in a while it's going to go all the way to the top but it's not a real practical way to do stuff in the cloud, and you don't need to. So when I talk about projects that provide substantial ROIs to companies, I talk about moving up the cloud stack. So when you're running on-premise, you own everything. Storage, networking, all the way up. You're patching operating systems, or at least somebody is, and your apps are being deployed on that. Your quick flip to the cloud, you virtualize the servers, now you pay for them by the hour. But it can be expensive to do it that way. You got rid of buying the hardware, but you're still paying for provisioning for peak. You can tune this, but as you move further up the stack into the platform pieces, now you're needing fewer virtual machines and more of the platform pieces that you only pay for with utilization. You get more elasticity until you can get all the way up the stack where as much is virtualized as, pos as possible and you can uh, I'll only pay for what you consume and this is where the pricing gets really decent. We can do this, it just takes time. The trick is proposing projects like this. So, because often we're in a feature cycle, you know, our employer is used to us just cranking new features out and maybe those features aren't going to be the highest return if you start speaking business back to them about being more efficient and spending less to get the same results, these kinds of projects start to make more sense to them, too. You know, there's nothing like a big, fat Amazon bill to at least get the CFO saying, why, why does this cost so much and what can we do about it? And you can start proposing projects that largely move up the stack, should be able to reduce those bills and get better results for you. These are really measurable ROI projects. Often we're building software where it's harder to see the value. And so going onto these, while they may not be as sexy, they're still interesting problems, but they do provide various obvious value to your organization. And because they, they do, they will cost less. You will save the company money, money that could be applied to other things elsewhere. All right, let's get a little more abstract. That's pretty much still plumbing-related stuff. Uh, let's talk about the refactoring of software. This was another problem that I found extensively post-pandemic, or even during the pandemic. So what are we talking about multi-channel versus omni-channel? Often organizations build a line of work uh, in a silo. So they have retail outlets, and they have warehousing to supply multiple re retail outlets. Supplies come from that warehouse to the retail stores. That's fine. Returns go back into the warehouse. Like that's, all of that works. Then they decide they need an online presence, so they build a website. But they probably may not feed off of the same channel at all. They might even run a separate warehouse just for supplying web because they go to, now the distribution is largely done by shipping, so rather than making it close to where shoppers would be, they make it close to where the transport hubs are. So you have a warehouse for your web sub, uh, supplied sales and you have a separate warehouse for your store supplied sales. I saw companies get into the situation, the pandemic, where their web stores ran out of stock 
But their retail stores were full of stock because the stores were closed. And their warehouses didn't even have it available because they'd never consolidated the pieces together. And you, you've run into this if you've ever bought something online and you had to return it by mailing it back, you couldn't take it to the store or return it. Omnichannel is the idea that it doesn't matter where I buy it or where I get service from it, all of the methodologies work. I can go into the store, I can go online, I can work from my phone, we treat it all equally. It's harder than it looks. And most organizations didn't think omnichannel at the beginning, so they have a set of silos in place. This is a huge ROI project. It's also really flipping hard to do. You know what you need to make this work? Diplomacy. Because you're now, there's a reason those different stacks are separated from each other. They are run by different people. And they may not like each other. And the idea that we're all going to work and play well with each other to bring those pieces together, that's hard work. But hugely valuable. And so you may look into your own organization and say, is there a space here where we have separate stacks that we shouldn't and maybe being able to combine them together would make a difference to the organization? It's not a feature-based product even. You know? It's not the obvious thing, but it is a valuable thing. And it certainly creates substantial value in you to be able to solve these classes of problem. Now, it doesn't mean we can't build innovative software. Lots of folks are excited about the new technologies that are out there. If you want to bring machine learning into your organization, go for it. Image recognition is a good one. Just sometimes it's hard to see the value in all of it, right? Like that's the challenge for us when we want to write new software. Our image recognizers do what we wanted to do. I wish I had made this picture up. It's a totally reasonable thing for a piece of software to do, right? To do multiple recognizers on, one, on a given image. These kinds of technologies, the challenge is finding the ROI of them. You've got to really work from a hypothesis basis, that if we add this capability to the software, it's going to improve these things that trickle into value to customers so they buy more, or that it costs us less to service that customer, higher levels of satisfaction. And often we don't work that problem, like we just don't think through the value at that level. But if you go into a project like this that's more speculative, these are the first projects that can be cut if there's going to be cuts, and they can make you vulnerable. Now, ChatGPT is hot, without a doubt. You know, life was pretty peaceful up until November of 2022. Uh, and if you followed the actual story, it's been many years in development. Then nobody set out to big, do a big splash in November 22. They had gotten to a point with GPT-3 where they were having problems. They, they'd run low on money. Um, for training sets, and so they basically opened it up to the public to be able to give, so that we would feed them training data, ask us new prompts, get new, and get new results back. And I think because we did it over Christmas, everybody got a little existential with the software, which is weird. You know, get a dog. But anyway, it happened the way it happened, and 100 million people signed up for ChatGPT in two months, and that was kind of a magic number. You know, that's the fastest for, to 100 million of anything ever. And so the whole tech industry kind of went a little nuts, starting with Microsoft, who had heavily invested in OpenAI early on, not knowing this would happen, but they, they saw an opportunity to move those workloads onto Azure, and so they took it years before, and now here they were. And then uh, Altman proposed a GPT-4, which required one of the largest supercomputers ever built out of cloud infrastructure to compute. Um, Microsoft gave them $10 billion in Azure credits, not cash, Azure credits, and they spent it. That's a lot of Azure. To build a model now that costs a lot of dollars to operate. So you're seeing in the news the conversations about they're losing $20 a month per person for GitHub Copilot which is just a, that's a flyer for saying, hey, it ain't going to be 10 bucks a month much longer. The question is, is it still valuable $30 a month? Which, you know, you don't need very many good ideas from that tool before a 30 bucks in a month is a deal. So, you know, we're in early days for this technology and we're still feeling around what the value prop is going to be. 
I do think there's a lot of heat on folks to say, how are we going to incorporate this? This is provide a competitive advantage, not just that it's cool. And you've certainly seen talks here this week about incorporating large language models into software. I watched Phil's ha Phil Hack's talk from the hallway because the room was completely filled, which is an interesting sign. Microsoft's clearly running hard on this. They keep rebranding it. Clearly, they've grabbed GitHub's name, Copilot. For a while there, it was, there's going to be an M365 Copilot, there's a security Copilot, and there's a Windows Copilot, and now they're just saying Microsoft Copilot. But really, they're a platform company, which means they want to have you build Copilots. And the idea of having a large language model over top of your company is an interesting one that possibly could provide some substantial value. And I hope you're paying attention to some degree there. I find this more speculative for the value proposition. This is because we're in such early days. But I also say, hey, if leadership really wants it and you're the one who facilitates it, that's another way to keep your job for sure. So, you know, as much as the, the old cynical engineer in me looks at this and goes, I think I'd like that cook for a little while, a little lo longer. You know, on .NET Rocks, I'm making podcasts every week. And so I have already pushed back on everybody who wants to talk about making large language models to say, show me the money. Show me the project in the field that's providing benefit. I'll put that show on. By the way, I have a couple. They'll be coming out in the next month or so. So the, there are folks that are being successful with that, and I'm feeling like I'll serve you as the guy who makes the podcast to make sure we're talking about real stuff, not speculative stuff. But the amount of energy that exists around this provides its own cover. Okay, less speculative, more concrete, but far less sexy. Our companies collect a lot of data and they simply don't do enough with it, plain and simple. If you want to provide value to your organization in a big hurry, get better at data analytics. In the old days, we had predictive analytics models and all these different styles of analysis, the fractal time series, the, the Elliott waves, all of these kinds of things. Back in the 90s, you would spend months analyzing your data to decide which of these data mining algorithms made sense for your compute. These days, you don't do that anymore. The cloud's fast enough and cheap enough that if you've got your data up there, you can run all of them and then compare them, pick which one you like the best results-wise. So we've gotten, made it much easier to get into predictive analytics models. And now with the modern machine learning tools coming on, and this is not LLMs. Like LLMs have kind of overwhelmed the thinking right now. But before ChatGPT, we were doing machine learning in useful ways. We were using neural nets to analyze data. And the combination of predictive analytics and machine learning models is powerful because it allows us to extract more value from data to get bigger insights into where companies are going, what uh, numbers are available to them. You notice I haven't said artificial intelligence until now, because it's a stupid phrase. Artificial intelligence is, was coined in the 1950s by a set of scientists that were trying to raise money from the military. The first time the public heard the phrase artificial intelligence was 2001, A Space Odyssey, in 1968. And then Hal tried to kill everybody. So, you know, setting up the relationship with the term. Generally speaking, when I'm talking to companies about, hey, we want to incorporate AI into the organization, I'm like, okay, what do you mean when you say that? And most of the time, they don't know. They also, you use that term when the technology doesn't work. Because the moment it does work, it gets a new name. You know, they, they keep calling ChatGPT AI because it's good for fundraising, but it's a large language model. And predictive analytics is a, it can be done with machine learning models, and when combined with uh, with deeper mo data models, can actually get into this idea of prescriptive analytics. So now you're cycling actions against the data that it generates to do additional prediction. This technology is starting to spread fairly far. If you've ever gone to an e-commerce site, thrown some stuff in a shopping cart just to see what it looked like, and then abandoned the cart, and then you know, a day or two later you get an email about that cart, you're being prescriptively analyzed. They're seeing if they can prompt you to come back. right? And it's literally being done strictly with software. 
It's just that, hey, it works if someone has been to my site and gone so far as to throw stuff in the cart to send an email about related products around that. Sometimes they'll get results from that, and they'll analyze those results and feed back in the next loop. We can get deeply into analyzing data and building these models and software around it because when you get it right, it makes the company a lot of money. You are now extracting additional value from existing customers and finding new sales for existing products. The most profitable work that most companies can do. Looking for new products and new customers is expensive compared to getting yield from your existing customers and your existing products. And analyzing the data that your company already has is a very effective way to get those kind of results. Okay. Uh, often we're building valuable software and we just don't know it. We have no idea if the feature we've just written and deployed is even being used, except from the complaints. All right? Rarely do we actually measure positive results. The modern telemetry tools, and I point to open telemetry, we talked to charity majors yesterday about this. They help us to measure the utilization of tools. If you want to create an effect, like really show the value in your work, one of the things is to measure the results of the products that you build, the features that you put out there. Putting telemetry in them so that you can use contemporary tools to analyze that data makes it far easier for you to write a results report. All too often, we pass the test and it goes into the CI CD pipeline and we don't think about the code we write ever again. We just send it off in the ether. That's somebody else's problem. And that's not owning your ROI. The return on your software comes from its utilization, not its creation. And so if you don't look at its utilization, how do you know if you're doing anything useful? Measuring results is a part of the DevOps pipeline. It's just that often, while we've talked about this great cycle of planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, and deploying, almost no one's looking across the entire cycle. You know, often this is just a relationship between people that once it got into the pipeline and got released, you never thought about it again. And the ops guys were dealing with it, living out in the world, operating it and monitoring it. And maybe they fed back to the designers some of the results to then be pushed back to you for new construction. But it's in your best interest, ultimately, to know how your software is being used. Ask for the reports. Who's looking at this stuff? What is the result of the software that's be, that we're building? Is it being used? And is it being tuned? You know, second pass on a feature, or you often get a bunch of better results. I got into this habit because I pushed out a feature, and this is in the 90s, that people used in a way I hadn't even thought of, and it took the system out in a week. And when I went back and looked at the logs that I'd never bothered looking at before, you could see the signs of this data was growing out of control because folks were using a feature in a way I hadn't expected. And so I got into a habit of you roll a feature out and then you watch the logs to see how it's being utilized. And then I would write a little summary up to my manager saying, hey, push this feature out. Over the past week, this many people have used it. They use it this many times. We're seeing some additional resources being consumed here. I you know, might want to go back and do some optimization here, or maybe we need to buy another server. Just some insight, because it otherwise wasn't being scrutinized. And I mean, I hope it's happening in your organization anyway, but you should ask, and you should know, because it's part of you understanding your value. Often we're writing software. We can double the performance of pieces of our company, but we never talk about it. We never are aware of it. You know, a good sales manager, if they can raise sales 10%, like they get a big bonus. They've killed it. We write software that can double productivity. That person used to process 100 orders, now they process 200 orders. We never get a bonus for that. Mostly because we don't own the ROI. We're not paying attention to how our software gets used. We have this cycle. Most organizations are doing this to some degree. It's only a question of how strong it is. If you don't look at it, if you don't participate in it deeply, it's hard to know that you're doing something useful. All right, let's have a couple of calls to action. First, spend time to learn. We're often too busy working to actually spend some time working on the skills. Now, I'm probably talking to the wrong group of people because you're here. You've taken a week off, 
gotten away from the office, you were looking forward to the Porto weather, and you were denied. <laughs> so you stayed in the room, but maybe you learned a few things. And I hope you carry that back to your organizations and help others learn from it too. You know, if you want to be the one that always gets sent to the conference, be the one that teaches from what you learned at the conference. It's a good way to go. The folks who can express the value that, that, that they put into an event like this can help folks a lot. But it's taking a little time for you to always improve your own skills and find new opportunities can help everyone around you as well as yourself. Do spend some time thinking about ROI. Where are we providing value? Are we working on the right things? Does it, pro does it benefit the customer? How? How will we know when we did a good job? You know, shipping's not enough. How will we know when we did a good job? What was the benefit to the company? What was the benefit to the, cu to the customer? We, just, we often don't ask those questions. And now for the most inappropriate slide in my whole deck. Hunt sacred cows. This is not funny in India. India, India. It's a little funny here. What am I actually talking about? It's an old Mark Twain line that said, it's not what you know, it's what you know ain't so. Go after the assumptions, things that you think are always true but may not be true. And let me give you an example. This is the map of the world. It's just wrong, but it's the map of the world that we were taught as kids. This is a Mercator projection map from the 1500s. It keeps the latitude symmetrical <coughs> to make it easier for navigators to work, but it also distorts the equator, making it smaller, and it stretches the poles to make them dramatically bigger. We have better maps. The Peter's projection map is an area rule map. This is a better representation of our world, except for the one problem. It looks really wrong, because this is the thing we've always been taught, and this is what happens to actually be. Africa is the second largest continent. It, doesn't, it looks at here, it doesn't look at here. You know, Africa and South America almost look the same, right? But it's simply not true. This is an assumption that you knew the shape of the world. It's an easy one to make. We've been taught this. Can you learn? There's a better map. How many other assumptions are in our heads? And they're hard to find because they are assumptions, right? They're things we've been taught all along. And it's good to just ask the questions press against some of those things. Say, well, I know we believe this, but why? You know, what, what is it that comes from that? And the map is just a one example of that, and it's a lot easier on the cows. But I'll wrap up with this when we talk about what comes next from all of these things. We are very fortunate as technology people to figure out what comes next, because most of the time we get to make it. What we build for our organizations shape those organizations. The question is, are we building the right things? It's really up to us, and I hope you'll do the right thing too. Thanks so much for your time.